Hello, this short video is going to show you a search system for chest x-rays. There's a lot of different search systems and you may be familiar with some such as an ABCD approach, although what those initials stand for depends on how you were taught it. But this particular one is mine. It doesn't really matter what order you do these things in, but it does matter that you include all of these areas when you're searching. Before you even start interpreting the chest x-ray, it's important you check a couple of things. You need to make sure of the patient's name and date of the study that you're reading the study that you think that you're studying. You then need to check whether this is an AP or a PHS x-ray and that usually should be indicated somewhere on the film. A little clue if there's a left or right marker that's back to front that's going to be a PA study because that's going to affect how you interpret the study. You need to make sure whether this is performed in the upright position or whether this is a supine or a semi-supine film. Again, that's going to affect how you interpret this study. Next, you want to check film quality. How good a study this is will depend what you're able to interpret and how you interpret it. So let's think about film quality for a moment. What factors go into affecting film quality? Is the film rotated? and check that. We want to look at the medial ends of the clavicle and see if the spinous process lies midway between it. That works for an adult film. In a kid's film, look at the anterior ends of the ribs and make sure they look symmetrical. That tends to work a little bit better with children. We want to make sure that the study has adequate penetration. Penetration means that you should be able to see the thoracic spine through the heart, so it shouldn't be look completely white in the mediastinum, but it really shouldn't look like a, sp a thoracic spine study. In other words, you should still be able to see the lung markings. They shouldn't be completely blacked out. Next, you want to make sure that all areas of the thorax are included on the study. Check particularly that the costophrenic angles are included. Sometimes they get clipped off, particularly in a supine portable study. And finally, you want to look for the degree of inflation. Just remind ourselves that in a normal degree of inflation, the hemidiaphragm is down to approximately the 10th to 11th posterior rib. Counting them here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and here it's about 10 and a half, here's the 11th right here. And on the lateral study, this is shown as a nice degree of diaphragmatic curvature. If we draw a line here between the anterior and the posterior costophrenic angles, like this, then we should see at least three centimeters of curvature between that line and the top of the hemidiaphragm in a normally inflated lung. Here's a patient who is hyperinflated. The uh, diaphragms that come down to approximately the 11th rib posteriorly, but that, to be honest, is not as helpful as looking at the lateral study and you see how flat these hemidiaphragms are. You can pretty much put a ruler along that. Conversely, this patient is hypoinflated. See how in this patient, how high that diaphragmatic curvature is. You can see that diaphragm coming up almost all the way to the level of the uh, hilum which clearly is way too high on the lateral study. And the diaphragms come down to about the ninth posterior rib on the PA study. Just to show you how profound the effects of hypoinflation could be, the patient on the left has taken a very uh, low inspiration. You can see how wide the mediastinum looks. You can see how um, crowded the vascular markings are. It's really difficult to see subtle abnormalities. The same patient on the right was imaged the next day with a good inflation. Both of these are totally normal chest x-rays, but you can see that they look dramatically different. One final thing that I do look at before I even start looking for any abnormalities is the position of lines and tubes. The reason that I look at them at this stage is that if I find something abnormal on the chest x-ray, I tend to get kind of excited and distracted by it and I might forget to check lines and tubes. So in this intensive care patient, for example, we have a Entrachyl tube, which looks pretty good here. 
We have a whole bunch of EKG leads lying over the patient, and those are sometimes challenging to make sure that um, they're not within the patient. You've got to follow them off. And then we have this line, which you can see here. And just to zoom up on it here, I'm going to follow the line along. It comes from below in the patient. It's coming up the inferior vena cava, curls round and around in the right atrium, and ends up somewhere in the region of the tricuspid valve. And so that was supposed to be a pulmonary artery catheter. Clearly, it's not in the position that we want it to be. Okay, now we're going to get to the bit where we're actually looking for abnormalities. So I'm going to start. I always start the lung parenchyma. I like the lungs. What can I tell you? And the way that I'm going to search them is in a very systematic approach. I'm going to start by doing a sweep of both lungs. You can do this any way you like, but I use what I call the lawnmower approach. I go my, cast my eyes back and forth. Remember, the lungs come behind the hemidiaphragms. You want to keep going there. Don't stop when you get to the diaphragms. And I use something like this approach. So, broadly speaking, what am I now looking for? Well, I'm going to be looking for focal abnormalities in the lung. So that might be a mass, maybe it's an area of pneumonia, maybe it's an area of atelectasis. I'm going to be looking for diffuse abnormalities, so something that's much more subtle, maybe a ground glass opacity, maybe an asymmetry between the two sides. I'm going to be looking at the interstitial and the vascular markings. So I'm going to be looking out, seeing whether they look normal, normal size, are they too prominent, for example. And finally, I'm going to be looking for areas of abnormal lucencies. So perhaps a lucency due to a pneumothorax, for example, or perhaps more focal lucencies due to a cavity or a bulla. Before I leave the lung parenchyma, I want to compare the zones of both lungs. So I'm going to compare the upper zone, left and right, middle zones, left and right. These should be very symmetrical and sometimes just doing that comparison at the end will help you spot an additional abnormality. I then turn my attention to the lateral study, same sweep of the lung parenchyma that we did on the PA study and I'm looking for the same abnormalities. Next, look at the lung hyla. First of all, check their position. Don't forget, the left lung hyla should be always higher than the right. If it's not, there's something going wrong here. Then I want to look at the shape of them and the branching pattern and make sure there's no masses, they're not unduly enlarged. And this is obviously something that you acquire with experience from looking at a lot of chest x-rays. Turning my attention to the heart, I'm going to look at the size of the heart. So don't forget the cardiothoracic ratio is the widest internal dimension of the chest and the widest dimension of the heart, not including an epicardial fat pad. And then I also want to look at individual chambers. We've covered these in a different section, but just to remind you, we look at the right atrium. We're going to look at the left ventricle, the left atrium. On the PA studies, let's just label those for you. Right ventricle, left ventricle, and left atrium. If you remember those mediastinal lines that I tortured you with, I cast my eye around all of those. Make sure the right paratracheal line isn't enlarged, that the azagus area looks okay. Nothing going on the region of the superior vena cava. I can see the aorta. I can see the azagoesophageal line. And I can see the descending aortic line all the way down. We should be able to see all of these. If we can't see them, we need to know why. Run your eyes around the pleura of each lung. You're looking for lucencies such as a pneumothorax again just in case you didn't spot it when you were looking on your search of the lung parenchyma. But you're also looking for thickening, for nodularity. You're looking to make sure that those costophrenic angles are sharp bilaterally. There's no evidence of a pleural effusion, and so on. 
the silhouette sign is such a key finding of a multitude of different processes within the thorax that I pay special attention to it. So those lines that we talked about before, I want to make sure we're seeing that periotic line. Can we see the left heart border? Can we see the right heart border? If not, why not? Can we see both hemidiaphragms on both studies? Can we see the back of the heart? Can we see the front of the heart? Is there something lying up against it that's obscuring it? And if so, what? There are certain areas of the lung that I like to call danger zones. Um, these are areas of the lung that things tend to get missed because there's a lot going on. And so I spend one or two seconds towards the end of my search just having a double check, having a look at those apices, looking through the heart, checking again in the region of the lung hyla, making sure there's not something I'm seeing through the hemidiaphragms. On the lateral study, look down here, check up here, check in here. These are all places that stuff gets missed. Just takes two seconds to take a look. Different people have different ways of looking at the bony structures of thorax and the soft tissues outside of the lungs. I use the quadrant approach, so I look at each quadrant first of all. I'm looking at the shoulders, I'm looking at the clavicles, I'm looking in the area of the carotids for soft tissue calcifications, the right upper quadrant, looking for gallstones, looking for free air under the diaphragm, left upper quadrant, region of the stomach, the region of the spleen. You'll pick up a lot of things by looking in these areas. And finally, I cast my eye down all the ribs on both sides. On the lateral study, areas you want to be particularly aware of, again, just check under the hemidiaphragms. Often you'll see soft tissue calcifications here or calcified mass, or you'll see some free air under the hemidiaphragm. Make sure that you look down the spine, specifically looking for areas of vertebral collapse or metastases. Here's an example of a patient where that kind of thing's going to be helpful. I'm just going to give you a couple of seconds to look at this study. And I hope you noticed here, and here, and here, that there's air under the hemidiaphragms. In this case, it was a post-surgical change from a patient who's had a, a laparotomy of no clinical significance, but obviously you have to check that out. It's not until I've finished my search that I start to compare to old films. And don't forget, with old films you want the old, which might be yesterday or it might be a couple of days ago, but then you want the older old, as I call it. So you want to be able to compare to a chest x-ray that's several months old, or even better, let's look at a chest x-ray from last year or the year before. If you're looking at an AP study, try to find another AP study for comparison where the patient looked good. Here's a uh, current chest x-ray on the left. These are both PA chest x-rays and an older chest x-ray on this patient on the right. So, and you can see here there's a very subtle increase in the interstitial lung markings and prominence of the hyla on the, as well as the heart looking a little bit bigger than previously. A little blunting of the costophrenic angle maybe. When, and none of these changes were present previously, but much easier to see when you have the comparison, quite easy to miss if you're looking at that study in isolation. It would be easy to call it normal. Here's her lateral study. And again, just look at the lung hyla here, look at the interstitial markings. She has tiny little pleural effusions here compared to the nice, sharp costophrenic angles here. Just rub that off so you can see it a little better. Again, this really helped you by having an older comparison. So in conclusion, it doesn't really matter what order you do the study review of a chest x-ray in, but you need to include all those steps. And you'll find after a while that there is one particular schema that works for you. So stick to that because it's going to make sure you don't miss something. Don't gestalt films. You really need to search and analyze them until you've seen your first few thousand chest x-rays, which unless you go into radiology might take quite a few years. And this system, although it seems incredibly tedious when I'm going through it like this, takes about a minute per study uh, for a normal study. Obviously, we're not covering the abnormal chest x-ray in this lecture, but just one word of advice. If you see an abnormality on a chest x-ray, kind of register it in your mind, go back to your search pattern, continue all the way through, and then come back to analyzing the abnormality. 
Um, the challenge is to not get distracted, spend a lot of time looking at the pneumonia, for example, and completely miss the pneumothorax because you forget to complete the rest of your search. Thank you for listening.